pleasure this morning to announce our next, to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Lawrence Afrin. Dr. Afrin is a professor of medicine at the University of Minnesota, and since the mid-2000s, his work has, fo has focused on hematology, specifically on mast cell disease, something of great in interest to many in our community. Dr. Afrin has an extensive record of publications. He serves on editorial boards of many prominent journals, as, as well as being on the medical advisory board for the mastocytosis society. So this is one of the areas where we have a lot of overlap, and Dr. Afrin's expertise is really appreciated and needed in our community. Dr. Afrin is consistently recognized as one of America's best doctors, and we're very, very thrilled and grateful to have him with us today. Please join me in offering a warm welcome to Dr. Afrin. Thank you all for coming out on a Sunday morning. Um, running a little short on uh, time, uh, I'll be uh, skipping some slides at the end, but I think you have all the slides in your um, devices and, and printouts, so I'll be happy to take questions at the end. Just a couple of corrections. I actually have now rotated off the board at the Master Psychosis Society. Uh, everybody goes through rotations. Um, and I'm only an associate professor, not a full professor of medicine. Um, so, uh, you know, why am I uh, here this morning? I, I very much appreciate the invitation uh, from Laura to speak. Um, it's increasingly apparent there is some uh, connection uh, between at least some fraction of the dysautonomia population and some fraction of the mast cell population. And precisely what that connection, what that overlap, that intersection is, uh, will be the subject of research to come uh, for, for many decades to come. Uh, but I'm going to try to give you a sense this morning, a, an overview of what mast cell activation disease looks like, uh, the particulars of diagnosis and treatment uh, we can tackle later in, in, in in my experience, the biggest uh, challenge with this disease is simply getting to the point of recognizing in the first place even the possibility that somebody might have uh, a mast cell activation disorder. Um, so these are our uh, objectives this morning. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest. Uh, DI is uh, covering my, uh, my travel expenses. Uh, we'll talk about what's long been known about uh, mast cell um, activation disease um, and the new kid on the block, uh, mast cell activation syndrome, and if I have time, we'll talk briefly about uh, research being conducted um, at uh, my institution. Um, this is probably the, the dominant uh, area of, of what we've long known about mast cell disease, the allergic diseases. Uh, we've known about them for uh, centuries, if not millennia, of course. Uh, allergy, asthma, angioedema, urticaria, and potentially fatal anaphylaxis. Uh, this is an incredibly prevalent problem, and for reasons we do not understand, the incidence appears to be increasing. There are lots of theories about uh, out there about why that might be, but at present they're just uh, hypotheses and theories. Um, we do know the allergic diseases develop out of a combination of genetic factors that are very poorly understood, uh, mixed together with environmental influences. And I think uh, perhaps the most important thing to understand about the allergic diseases is that in general, uh, there's, they have little impact on mortality. The estimated survival for most of the allergic diseases is equivalent to that of the general population. Uh, therefore, if you're going to live as long as the average person is going to live, the primary issue you have with the allergic diseases uh, becomes quality of life issues. How well can you manage the disease for the decades that you will be suffering this until uh, you eventually pass. This is the other um, uh, 
disease uh, of the mast cell that we have long known about, and I want to briefly take you through uh, the history here. The very first uh, disease of mastocytosis, that is an inappropriate, excessive proliferation, a somewhat cancer-like proliferation of the mast cell, was uh, first described in 1869, a, uh, a peculiar type of uh, rash called urticaria pigmentosa. And it was about a decade later that there was actually the first description of the mast cell itself um, by actually uh, uh, some physicians in Germany. And then another decade before uh, it was understood that UP uh, was rooted in uh, what was essentially a disease of the mast cell. You had to fast forward another half century before we began to get some inkling that there were also forms of mastocytosis that were inside the body rather than just on the skin. And in that same decade is when we began understanding that the mast cell uh, produces uh, a, a wide variety of these very potent chemical signals or messengers that we generically call the mast cell mediators. And the very first mast cell mediator ever discovered was heparin. Uh, back in the 1930s, and most physicians, uh, of course, and, and, and most patients are familiar with heparin as a drug. Uh, relatively few uh, are aware that heparin actually is a natural product of the body. And there are only two cells that make heparin, uh, the mast cell and the basophil, and the mast cell makes far more of it than the basophil. Other um, mast cell mediators came to be defined over time. Um, a classification systems for mastocytosis began to emerge in the mid 90s, uh, about 20 years ago. Um, a, uh, a, one particular mutation in the dominant mast cell regulatory gene called KIT was discovered as being present in almost every case of uh, systemic mastocytosis. Um, two different Japanese groups discovered that at about the same time. And just a few years later, the key Spanish group in the mastocytosis area identified a particular abnormality um, on the surface of the mast cell, uh, an abnormality we detect through a procedure called flow cytometry. And this abnormality uh, was fairly specific for mastocytosis. Um, so our abilities to detect and diagnose the mastocytosis were improving as the 90s rolled along. And in 2001, we had not only the introduction of a drug called imatinib for uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia, uh, CML, a, a type of chronic leukemia, uh, and that drug was absolutely a home run for that disease, but we also had the uh, introduction of the World Health Organization's classification system for mastocytosis. And it was only about a couple of years later that some bright people discovered that there's a very small subset of the rare population of patients that have uh, systemic mastocytosis, uh, the, the subset of mastocytosis patients who don't have that KIT DA16V mutation seemed to be exquisitely sensitive to imatinib. And so imatinib came uh, to be a standard of uh, care for that uh, rare subpopulation of the patients with the rare disease of um, systemic mastocytosis. As the 2000s uh, and this decade have rolled along, it's become increasingly evident that the excess growth of mast cells in mastocytosis causes problems only in very rare and uh, unusually aggressive forms of that disease. Uh, most patients with mastocytosis have a much, well, let, let's call it a much more laid back uh, version of that disease, something called indolent systemic mastocytosis, and the problem with that disease really does not stem from the number of mast cells that those patients have. The problem stems from the inappropriate activation of the mast cells that those patients have, the inappropriate production and release of the various mast cell mediators. 
That's what causes the problems in indolent systemic mesocytosis. So this diagram is the spectrum of mast cell disease that we've long known. Um, I don't know if I have this pointer working. No. Okay. Um, so at the base of the mountain, allergies and anaphylaxis, and at the tip of the um, uh, the mountain, we have mastocytosis in its various forms. Cutaneous mastocytosis, about tenfold more common than systemic mastocytosis. And you can see that the different forms of mastocytosis, cutaneous and systemic, are each broken down uh, to other uh, subtypes. You can see that the entire mountain of mast cell disease uh, features inappropriate mast cell activation. And there's a small subset of mast cell activation disease that additionally features inappropriate mast cell proliferation. So this is what we've long understood about mast cell disease. So in the last few years, there has emerged a sense that there is another part to this mountain that we had long been missing. It's been right under our noses the whole time, but we've been missing it for a variety of reasons that will become evident uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Back in 1991, a couple of very smart people at Vanderbilt University uh, uh, published an article in which they hypothesized that a disease ought to exist in which there is inappropriate um, activation of the mast cell, inappropriate production and release of mast cell mediators, but without the inappropriate proliferation of the mast cell, the, without the, the overgrowth, the cancerous overgrowth that we see in mastocytosis. You had to fast forward 16 years to find the first case reports in which uh, what we now call mast cell activation syndrome was described. Some of these patients had the KIT-D816B mutation and some did not. Slightly later that year, we saw the first study of a somewhat sizable number of these patients, roughly 20. And what was interesting about this study is that they had gone looking for mutations in KIT in uh, the mast cells in these patients who appear to have mast cell activation syndrome. But they went beyond the standard probing for just the kit D816B mutation, and instead they looked for mutations anywhere in kit, which again is the dominant mast cell regulatory gene. And boy, did they find mutations galore. Um, they. Um, and, and then in the following years, other groups investigating mastocytosis began to find many other uh, mutations in other mast cell regulatory genes beyond just KIT. In 2010, the group in Bonn came out with a second study uh, of more mast cell activation syndrome patients, again showing this huge menagerie of mutations scattered all throughout kit, um, and they also looked at a healthy control population in whom they saw uh, few to none of these mutations. So in 2010, there was a proposal to re-christen this whole area of mast cell disease as mast cell activation disease. This is a proposal uh, coming out of Vienna and Harvard and NIH. And uh, the, the proposal was to rechristen the area's mast cell activation disease on the premise that all mast cell diseases, first and foremost, feature inappropriate mast cell activation, and there's only a tiny subset that additionally features the inappropriate proliferation that defines mastocytosis. Um, this proposal had uh, included the first proposal for diagnostic criteria for the mast cell activation syndrome. Uh, a few months later, an alternative proposal uh, came out from uh, the group in Bonn 
and I was privileged uh, to, to be able to participate in that project as last author. Um, there were problems with the initial proposal from uh, uh, in 2010, and that group released a revised proposal for diagnostic criteria in 2012, but there still are uh, a number of problems with that proposal being discussed in the literature. And in 2016, actually just last month, uh, the WHO released revised diagnostic criteria for mastocytosis. And I won't go through the details there. There really weren't many significant changes. The key thing is that there were not any statements about mast cell activation syndrome, which is probably appropriate because there continues to be this dialogue about what should the diagnostic criteria be uh, for what is turning out to be an extraordinarily heterogeneous disease. So I imagine that in time, the WHO will come to make a statement about this, but it will take some time. So this is my perception of the revised landscape of mast cell activation disease. We have the original mountain, but now you can see the mountain is merely the tip of an iceberg in which the bulk of the iceberg submerged below, if you will, a waterline of uh, easy clinical recognizability. We have this bulk of the iceberg that is this huge collection of disorders that we are collectively calling a mast cell activation syndrome. Over the decades to come, we will learn to sort out the, the assorted variants of mast cell activation syndrome. But for now, uh, we, uh, our understanding of this is so immature that all we can do at this point is just lump it all together as mast cell activation syndrome, and I'll show you in a few minutes how we characterize it. Just to illustrate here, again, I'm sorry I don't have a pointer, but, um, oh, maybe I do have a pointer. Um, so here's the mast cell. This is the stem cell in the bone marrow, and there are many different types of cells, uh, blood cells, that descend from the stem cell. The mast cell is but one of many. It is interesting, though, that the mast cell has been traced back by paleogeneticists, and who knew there were such people? Uh, but it has been traced back and determined that the mast cell actually is the original host defense cell for multicellular organisms. We can trace this back more than 500 million years. And back when the mast cell, or its forebears, was the only defense cell uh, keeping us alive, keeping us and our forebears uh, in various forms alive in very toxic and hostile environments, you can imagine that the mast cell has had to pick up an awful lot of tricks to keep us alive. And 500 million years later, it has not forgotten any of them. They are there. They are latent, dormant. There are other types of cells that have evolved over the last few hundred million years that are more specialized, much more effective and efficient at certain niche, uh, niches of defense, but the mast cell is still the jack of all trades. It remembers how to do an awful lot of things. And when it goes awry, uh, it, it has the ability to go awry to cause problems in an extraordinary number of dimensions. The mast cell uh, is of hematopoietic origin. That means it's born in the bone marrow. It, only, uh, it leaves the marrow shortly after it is born. It circulates only briefly and quickly exits the blood into the peripheral tissues. It is present in every vascularized tissue in the body, but it preferentially sites itself at the environmental interfaces, skin, respiratory tract, GI tract, GU tract, and around vessels, blood vessels and lymph vessels, where it is perfectly positioned to serve its principal role as a sentinel, a lookout for assaults and insults upon the body. Ordinarily, it sits there very quietly, just sensing 
we have many, many different mechanisms, what is going on around it. And it does largely nothing while it sits there, but when there is an insult, it swings into action instantly. And it swings into action much more quickly than the other defense cells uh, that I showed you uh, previously. Um, it can live for about two to four years, typically. It has a little bit of ability to mobilize in the tissue, but it's largely fixed once it hits the peripheral tissue. It synthesizes a wide uh, number of substances we call the mediators and releases various mediators upon various triggerings. And it's also important to understand that KIT, as I said before, is the dominant mast cell regulatory gene and, and protein. About 50,000 copies of KIT, that, uh, it, it, which is a transmembrane, so it spans through the cell membrane, a little bit of KIT sticking up above the membrane, then there's a part of KIT that's embedded in the membrane, and then the majority of KIT that is actually inside the mast cell. About 50,000 copies of that protein on the surface of every mast cell. And KIT is critical. Nor normally functioning KIT is critical for all key mast cell functions, including mast cell survival and mast cell activation. Um, I'm a union card carrying hematologist. I think I'm obligated to put up at least one diagram like this um, biochemical pathways that show that basically uh, the, the way it really works in the cell is that we have pairs of the KIT protein, which serve as a receptor for uh, a, a molecule called stem cell factor. And when stem cell factor engages what we call a homodimer, a pairing of KIT uh, proteins, there is a, uh, the, the binding here induces a change in the shape of the internal portion of KIT such that uh, th that change in the shape then leads to activation of a large number of downstream biochemical pathways by which the mast cell comes to have all of its uh, effects. Um, there are many triggers for the mast cell. Um, the physicians in this audience, uh, uh, you know, and, and I were all taught the classic uh, immunoglobulin E, IgE mediated method by which uh, mast cells get activated. Uh, mast cells have receptors for IgE on the surface of the mast cell. And uh, IgE is often pre-bound to these receptors. And when there is an antigen or an allergen uh, that is specific for a particular IgE molecule that floats by, grabs onto those IgE molecules, that induces a change in the shape of the internal portion of the IgE receptor that then triggers and activation of the mast cell. But there are many other ways to activate the mast cell. There are other receptors for, uh, there are various types of histamine receptors. KIT, of course, is the receptor for stem cell factor, receptors for IgG, for various complement components, uh, various neuropeptides, uh, receptors for opioids, receptors for benzodiazepines, receptors for cannabinoids. Uh, CRF is a very interesting trigger for the mast cell. This is corticotropin releasing factor or corticotropin releasing hormone, which is one of the first substances to come out of the brain anytime we are subject to stress, either physical stress or psychological stress. CRH floods out of the brain. There is a specific receptor on the surface of the mast cell for CRH and the mast cell gets immediately activated. And substance P is a uh, uh, mediator uh, in the neural circuitry that is involved in our perception of pain. And courtesy of Dr. Theo Theoharides at Tufts University, uh, who produced this amazing 3D video microscopy, um, I'd like to show you what happens when a mast cell uh, encounters 
a molecule of substance P. You can see all these pockets on the surface of the mast cell that are just sort of exploding. Very quickly, the instant a molecule of substance P engages the mast cell surface substance P receptor. The mast cell is capable of synthesizing and releasing many mediators, and I know that this is too small to see, and that is precisely the point, because this is merely a small subset of the total range of mediators that the mast cell is capable of producing and releasing. The physicians in this audience and I were all taught that the mast cell produces two mediators. We were taught this in the one minute that is spent on mast cell biology and disease out of our 10 years of medical training. We were taught the mast cell produces tryptase and histamine, and that's it. We move on because there's only one mast cell disease, mastocytosis, and it's an incredibly rare disease that most physicians may see only once in their career, so why would you spend any more time on that in your training? Well, now that we're beginning to understand there's another mast cell disease that is far more prevalent, uh, mast cell activation syndrome, it becomes more important to understand much more of the biology of the mast cell. If anybody is interested in exploring more of these mediators and actually uh, a, a much more complete list, there's an excellent website here. So, these are the current criteria from the WHO for diagnosing systemic mastocytosis, and I'm not going to go through these criteria, but I want to make the point that these criteria do an excellent job of very specifically diagnosing systemic mastocytosis. But in so doing, these criteria also create a huge problem. Because it turns out there are an awful lot of patients who have symptoms that look an awful lot like what you would expect in systemic mastocytosis, and we'll get into those symptoms in a minute. However, when you go testing them for systemic mastocytosis, tests which essentially boil down to looking at the blood level of tryptase, which should be substantially elevated, and looking in the bone marrow for large quantities of mast cells, and we go doing these tests in these patients whose symptoms strongly suggest they have mastocytosis, and yet we find nothing. So what do you do when you have these patients presenting with this huge range of problems which suggests the possibility, at least, that there might be mastocytosis here, and yet you cannot find the mastocytosis by the tryptase level or a bone marrow examination. What do you do when it looks like a duck, it acts like a duck, it quacks like a duck, but it's not a duck. This is where the new concept of mast cell activation syndrome comes in. These are the criteria uh, proposed by the Harvard NIH Vienna group uh, for diagnosing mast cell activation syndrome. In the interest of time, I, 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 don't, I don't have the time to go through this in detail. Suffice to say, there are uh, are a number of problems with these criteria, uh, challenges for diagnosing the disease by these criteria, uh, aspects of the disease that these criteria don't particularly well fit, and I will readily admit, uh, especially as last author on the proposal, that I have a bias for the alternative um, set of criteria. Uh, this, uh, these, are, and these criteria are structured much like the criteria for mastocytosis. Uh, there, is, uh, there are major criteria and minor criteria. And again, in the interest of time, I will just cut to the bottom line that most patients who are diagnosed with mast cell activation syndrome by these criteria achieve the diagnosis through a combination of the second major criterion here, 
together with the last minor criterion here. So this is a combination of a clinical presentation that is consistent with what mast cell activation is expected to be able to do, together with multiple points of laboratory evidence of abnormal mast cell activation. Of course, the doctor also has to make sure that you don't have any other disease that can better account for the entirety of what's been going on in the patient. There are increasing estimates of prevalence of MCAS, various uh, numbers cited in the literature, as high as 17% of the general population might have MCAS. This is all very preliminary. Keep in mind, first case reports published only in 07, less than a decade ago. This is all very early work. Um, but it is interesting, from another perspective, that if you add up the total number of patients, at least in the first world, who have one or more chronic inflammatory disease, those estimates are roughly 15 to 20 percent of the general population, a number that is right in line with this number. Now, I'm of course not saying that every patient with chronic inflammatory disease has a mast cell activation syndrome. But it is a curious coincidence of numbers. And if nothing else, I think it highlights that we're in a new era where if one has uh, a number of chronic inflammatory conditions, it becomes reasonable to consider the possibility that a mast cell activation syndrome might be present and at the root of all evil in, uh, in such patients. There is increasing evidence of critical mast cell involvement in a wide variety of chronic inflammatory diseases. This is just a small uh, subset here. And this raises the question as to what portions of these populations uh, including the dysautonomia population and all of its various subtypes, what portion of these populations might bear mast cell disease which is driven by mutational abnormalities as found in the, uh, by the folks at Bond? And we'll get into more of that in well, actually right now. There's an increasing understanding that mast cell activation syndrome may be clonal or mutationally rooted in most cases. More than 50 mutations have now been found just in KIT, and most patients actually appear to have multiple mutations in KIT. These appear to be largely acquired, not inborn, but they are typically acquired early in life. One of the challenges for figuring this out in the clinical setting is that in the clinic, in, in most clinical laboratories, we only have the ability at present to look for the D816V mutation. We do not have the ability at present in the clinical laboratory, most clinical laboratories, to look for mutations anywhere else in KIT. It will probably be at least, I'm guessing, another decade before that ability is routine. However, all of this mutational data that has been emerging about mast cell activation syndrome has been reported only by one laboratory so far at the University of Bonn. This has not been reported by any other group uh, thus far. I'm actually running a project right now trying to confirm this. The lack of any independent confirmation to date is not because other groups have tried to find these mutations and failed, but rather that no other groups have even tried to find them. So this is the model that is emerging um, uh, of how one disease, so to speak, could produce so many different uh, problems. Mast cells produce and release scores of mediators, and if there is one mutation making the mast cell misbehave in a particular set of ways, that is going to create some potential for multi-system illness and variability from one patient to the next. But it's more complicated than that because most patients appear to have multiple mutations in KIT, creating even more potential for illness in a variety of ways. But it's even worse than that because we're now beginning to sense that there are multiple genes, uh, mast cell regulatory genes, likely mutated in most MCAS patients. 
And it gets even worse because each mediator doesn't have just one effect. Each mediator has a huge variety of effects. So if there were nothing but mutations driving this disease, you can already see huge potential for uh, a, a very wide variety of, of manners in which mast cell disease can present. But there are other ways, too, in which the mast cell might be triggered into misbehavior. You heard uh, extensively yesterday about autoantibodies. Uh, potentially driving various forms of dysautonomia. We already know about two autoantibodies that can drive mast cell activation. There is an anti-IgE autoantibody. There is an anti-IgE receptor autoantibody. Um, and there likely are going to be many, many, many other autoantibodies uh, found in the future that can also activate mast cell disease. So how much of the mast cell activation in any given MCAS patient is being driven mutationally versus how much is being driven by autoantibodies is going to be an extraordinarily complex problem uh, to be solved uh, in the future. So this is what mast cell activation uh, syndrome looks like. I'm going to go through this very quickly in my remaining few minutes. Um, typically, these patients are, the, the, the symptoms initially emerge early. They go unrecognized for decades as to what's actually going on. It is usually multi-system. The symptoms are often inflammatory. There is a perplexingly inconstant course. There is a wide variety of mediator expression in the disease. These patients see boatloads of doctors. They obtain truckloads of diagnoses. And, not, and, and of course, they try plain loads of, of different treatments, often to little uh, effect. Very importantly, especially for any physicians in the audience, it has to be recognized these patients often stop reporting their troubles because they learn early on there's no point. They spent a year or two investigating a given symptom. They went through lots of evaluation. They achieved nothing. So they stop telling their doctors about it. I have had patients come to see me where only when I ask them specifically do they tell me that they have been passing out every day for the last 20 years. That was not their chief complaint. But they tell me that when I ask them. And they're surprised that I thought to ask that question. So it's very important for physicians to take a complete review of systems in these patients. The constitutional issues are all over the map. Some feel hot, some feel cold. Fatigue is a very common problem. Uh, uh, nocturnal sweats, fluctuating weight, itching. These are the patients with the odd and prolific arrays of sensitivities. The theme here is inflammation, 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 inflammation. And it keeps going in this fashion, system by system by system. The nodes can, the lymph nodes can enlarge and shrink. Various inflammatory issues in the pulmonary tree, a wide variety of inflammatory and other issues in the cardiovascular system, including the ability to become hypertensive or hypotensive out of the blue just on a moment's notice, and many patients will very quickly alternate from hypertension to hypotension. Um, the inflammation continues to the GI system and the GU system. These patients often drive their gastroenterologist batty with the alternating diarrhea and constipation. They often drive their urologist and the primary care physician batty with the recurrent urinary tract infections, which the urine cultures are negative for. It's because it's not an infection. Not saying that an infection can't happen in a patient with mast cell disease. Obviously, mast cell disease does not make one immune to developing any other problems. And yet, it is quite possible to have sterile inflammation of the urinary tract and inflammation, whether it's of infectious origin or sterile origin, it hurts. The muscles and the joints and the bones 
are frequently involved. I said the mast cells tend to hang out of the skin and other environmental interfaces, so there are many ways in which this disease manifests in the skin and the other aspects of the integument. The, the hair loss and nail changes and dental deterioration are very common. The CNS, absolutely, is subject to involvement in this disease. Doesn't mean it will be involved, just that there is that potential. Um, sorry, let me back up just a second and to note that this is merely one aspect by which mast cell disease intersects with dysautonomia. There is no major psychiatric disorder which has not been seen in association with mast cell disease. The hematologic issues are all over the map with too many or too few red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, too much or too little clotting. To my brethren hematologists, I will tell you that the marrow, very confoundingly, is almost always normal in mast cell activation syndrome. The immune system certainly is not immune to being affected by mast cell disease. A wide array of consequences when you're immune system is disordered, and there's a wide array of endocrinologic and metabolic effects. This is just a small subset of what this disease can produce. So I'm going to close uh, with the next one or two slides here and just say this is the problem your doctors are facing. Pity your doctors. <laughs> the last 5,000 years, we have been trained, one generation has trained the next, that diagnosis is an art in pattern recognition. We spend roughly 10 years learning, I don't know, 1,000, 10,000 different diseases, each of which is hallmarked by one or two particular patterns. Symptom A plus physical exam finding D plus test result C equals diagnosis D. That is diagnosis. So what is your doctor supposed to do now that there is a disease whose biological essence guarantees that it is going to present in a thousand different ways? Learning how to recognize when chronically ill patient A presents, looking and acting and feeling completely differently from chronically ill patient B, who looks and acts and feels completely differently from chronically ill patient C, and so on and so forth, and yet under the hood, all of them have different forms of what we're now calling a mast cell activation syndrome. This is a very difficult thing to learn how to do. So go easy on your doctor, please. It does turn out there are a couple of meta patterns that identify for this disease. If you have multiple chronic inflammatory ills, often unsatisfactorily responsive to treatment, or you have a definitively diagnosed ailment, let's say you have a lymphoma. But there are other problems going on here that aren't well accounted for by that definitively diagnosed disease. Let's say you're passing out every day. Lymphoma does not well explain passing out every day. So there's probably something else going on, and there might be something going on that is actually underlying both of those conditions. So how are we going to learn to better recognize this? Are we going to have our patients sitting in the waiting room filling out questionnaires? And there actually is a validated symptom questionnaire for this disease out of the group in Bong. Are we going to program our fancy electronic medical record systems to recognize the very complex patterns by which this disease presents? I don't know, maybe, eventually. Computers are well sorted to recognizing complex patterns, but it's going to take time to do this. So until then, the best diagnostic aids are a complete history in physical and faith in Occam's razor, which all medical students learn practically on day one of medical school. The simplest solution is the most likely one. And yet by day two, almost, we are facing patients who have lists of 58 different problems, and we are taught to dissect each of those problems and to focus on just one or two problems at each visit. And it becomes very, very difficult for us to step back and take a look at the big picture. 
and perhaps a renewed emphasis on looking at the big picture will help improve recognition of the possibility that a given patient with chronic, mysterious, multi-system, inflammatory, plus-minus allergic illness might have a mast cell activation disease. Um, I don't have the time to go through the diagnostic workup. The prognosis, actually, is just as good as for allergies. Most patients with MCAS, by preliminary data, seem to have uh, a normal lifespan. It's just that it's going to be a chronically miserable life until uh, it's accurately diagnosed and effectively controlled. And there's the good news. There are a lot of drugs that have been shown helpful for various patients with mast cell activation disease. And most patients with mast cell activation disease do appear able to eventually find some regimen that helps them achieve the goal of feeling significantly better than the pre-treatment baseline the majority of the time. The biggest frustration is that at present, the state of our understanding, this, the state of the science in this area, is so immature we have no way yet to predict which medications are most likely to help which symptoms in which patient. So there is no substitute for both the patient and the, the treating physician practicing a whole lot of patience and persistence and a very methodical approach in stepping through the different treatments in trial and error fashion. And most patients will uh, realize success. I really don't have the time to go into the treatments. Uh, they are in your conference materials. Uh, but like I said, if you have the patience and the persistence to step through this, most patients find helpful therapy. And I do not have time to go into uh, the research. I will say where we need to head next in this area, we need to get much better with our diagnostic techniques and methods. We need to better understand what's causing this. Better understanding the cause will lead us to developing better therapies. Of course, we need to continue our efforts with education. And this is just a summary of all the points I've uh, mentioned previously. So thank you very much for your attention. Happy to take questions. Dr. Eiser. Honestly, at this point, um, I'm not sure it matters. Um, there is so little awareness in the general physician community, including the allergy community and the hematology community of this, that I'm not sure it makes a lot of difference. Uh, perhaps the allergists ought to be more aware of this than any other uh, subspecialty yet. Um, but what I have found in practice is that is not yet the case. Perhaps in another five years, it'll be obvious that the allergist will be the go-to people for this. Perhaps it'll be obvious it will be the hematologists or I hope the primary care physicians. Um, we'll see. Yes, ma'am. Um, excellent question. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, it appears that mast cell activation patients have a considerable propensity for reacting, for being triggered by one or more of the excipients, the fillers, the binders, the dyes, the preservatives in their medication products. Step one in managing most mast cell activation disorders is actually not trying any particular medication not even antihistamines. Step one is identifying your triggers as precisely as possible and then doing your best to avoid them. On occasion, it's possible to desensitize patients to their triggers, but much more commonly, it's a matter of avoidance. But simply identifying uh, that an ex a particular excipient, uh, say, you know, red dye number 40 or sodium benzoate or, or povidone, is a trigger, and then scrupulously uh, ridding your regimen of that trigger can make a huge difference 
in the well-being of uh, a patient with mast cell activation disease. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to ask one, um, I just have two questions. The first one is, I've seen a bit in the literature about problems with beta blockers in mass cell activation diseases, and obviously that's a pretty common situation, and a lot of us get talk, especially with other drugs and other drugs, it seems to be no literature for mass cell issues. So, is my first question is whether, when you're classing these with beta blockers, whether it's a matter of procedure caution, or if it should be completely avoided in patients who have a recognized mass cell disease. Um, and then also, kind of your, your, your thoughts on the role of anxiety that can come with having um, kind of severe reactions after my first anaphylactic post from an early anaphylactic episode. I find myself being very hyper aware of things like getting a finger in my face or if my tongue starts swelling up. And plus, that stress and anxiety really seems to make things worse. So, I guess, coping with that. Um, let me take the second question first. Um, I think the complexity in that question is that it is essentially a chicken and egg question. Is the anxiety a reaction to your becoming aware of these other symptoms, or is the anxiety itself a primary symptom of an emerging episode of mast cell activation? Because the mediators that come out of the mast cell, uh, especially mast cells up in the central nervous system, uh, certainly have the potential to drive anxiety and panic. Um, I think the bottom line is, uh, for, first of all, uh, you know, there, there are medications uh, called the benzodiazepines which can help settle down anxiety, and there actually are specific receptors on the surface of the mast cell for benzodiazepines. And there are a number of mast cell activation patients for whom a regular dosing, uh, uh, usually a low dose, but nevertheless regular dosing of a benzodiazepine can be extraordinarily helpful for uh, providing, uh, uh, yeah, for, for maintaining control over the activation disease. Uh, but beyond that, I, I can only emphasize common sense. If you are concerned uh, that things are going south, you are better off going to an urgent care center or an emergency room and getting evaluated. I, I offer all my patients the extreme example that mast cell disease is capable of causing a heart attack, actually via multiple different routes. But mast cell disease is also capable, as you saw, of causing inflammation in a number of other ways, and chest pain without a heart attack is also a very common symptom. So when a patient with diagnosed mast cell disease develops severe chest pain, how do you know? whether it's just inflammatory chest pain or it's an emerging heart attack. You don't know. So you go to the emergency room when that happens, and yes, I get it. The ER doctors, the ER nurses, the triage staff, and you all get very, very tired of going to the ER and having nothing found on the EKG and the X-ray and whatnot. However, after you've done that 99 times, and when the 100th time comes and the pain comes on and you go to the ER and the EKG leads are put on, put on you and oh my God, there's a heart attack there. Oh boy, will you be happy that you got into the habit of going to the ER when severe chest pain came on. Uh, you know, even though you knew you were going to have to withstand the rolling eyes of, of the ER staff. Um, you, you have to use common sense. And I will tell you that when you're having a heart attack, regardless of whether it's due to mast cell disease or not, popping Benadryl is not going to be the answer. You need heart attack medicine. You may have a better outcome if you take both heart attack medicine and mast cell medicine, but at a bare minimum, if you don't take heart attack medicine, you will die. So uh, I, I can only say common sense. 
in evaluating serious symptoms. As to the first uh, question, the beta blockers, um, uh, there are certain reasons why beta blockers are relatively contraindicated in mast cell disease. One reason is it's thought that they might interfere with the ability of epinephrine to rescue a patient from anaphylaxis. However, there are workarounds to that, uh, such as glucagon, and when a patient just has to have a beta blocker, then those patients should probably be armed with glucagon pens rather than epipens. So, there are very few things in medicine that are absolute no-nos. So I won't go so far as to say beta blockers are an absolute no-no in mast cell disease, but they are relatively contraindicated. Okay. Uh, I'm going to switch back between the microphones, and I don't even know how much time we have for questions, so two more questions. All right. Um, we honestly don't know at this point what the intersection is between POPs and mast cell activation and disease of any type. I will tell you my own speculation based on my clinical experience is I suspect mast cell activation syndrome is the root issue underlying some fraction of the pox population. Um, how large or small a fraction, I don't know. That, that research has got to be done. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Well, well, I'm going to be recommending for a slot to implant a patient that has all of the clinical features of the condition, but may have the case in his community, but who's responsive to her H1 and H2 blockers. And then the follow up question is what do you think is set up? Um, I would strongly recommend that definitive diagnosis be obtained before pursuing any therapy for mast cell disease beyond perhaps antihistamines on the premise that appropriately those antihistamines really can't hurt anybody, either medically or financially. Um, beyond antihistamines, I, I strongly recommend that you establish a definitive diagnosis of mast cell disease. Tryptase is usually normal in mast cell activation syndrome. Histamine, most commonly, is normal. And instead, there are a variety of other mediators that can be checked in blood and urine, and there are even other ways one can go about trying to diagnose MCAS. Um, and I, I, I really encourage that you obtain a diagnosis before pursuing uh, therapies that have you know, potential risks, uh, not to mention uh, expenses associated with them. I, I, I think, you know, there's a reason those drugs are available over the counter. Um, Ketodophen is one of many, many, many medications available uh, that, have been sh uh, that have been shown helpful in various patients with mast cell disease. Uh, it is a medication that I commonly try in many of my patients. Sometimes it helps. Often it does not. I have not yet learned to predict how to predict which patients are most likely to benefit from that drug. So don't know what else to say about it. I do have a question. I just wanted to be uh, thank you very much for your time. And uh, we have a couple of questions for the next question. But we, if anybody has additional questions, you can just let us know. Sure. Thank you so All right. much. Thank you.